get or buy or give to the McDonald's. Okay. Now this is our first week, so uh, we need to excuse you by your grade. So let's start with the seventh and eighth graders. Who's, who's the teacher? Follow the Pied Piper. Follow the Pied Pied Walter.
There you go, November 10th. <laughs> Veterans Day and Martin Luther's birthday. Sorry, I got to, I got to make everything a birthday. I just can't help myself. So, more about that as we get a wee bit closer. Any other announcements? All right. So we are still on Matthew chapter 25. You guys completely derailed me with a birthday party last week um, so that I wasn't able to finish. But that's okay because it was all great fun. But we're going to finish Matthew 25 this week. I'm just saying. So, so we were working on the kind of the second half of this parable. Um, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So remember that uh, those on the right, the sheep, had received the inheritance prepared for them before the foundation of the world. And then here, the, uh, the ones on the left, the cursed, um, go to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So it was not prepared for them. Um, uh, and the difference is that they were hungry. I was hungry, Jesus said, you gave me no food, and thirsty, you gave me no drink. Strangers did not welcome me naked, did not clothe me sick or in prison, and who did not visit me. And then they say, what up? I don't know what you're talking about. We never saw you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison or sick. And he says, Whatever you do these things, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So we have this, this remarkable connection between, um, between God's people, or let's say, I'm going to even expand that just a little bit more and say people, and, and Christ. We had... Whenever you do these things to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then here it's the least of these, you did not do it to me. But how we love our neighbor, let's say this, is a reflection of what we believe about who God is and what he does for us. Let me say that one more time. How we love our neighbor, where we love our neighbor, when we love our neighbor, is a reflection of what we believe about who God is and what God does for us. Um, we get that a little bit in our epistle this morning, when I, which I did not pre preach on, but would certainly have been fun to preach on, which is that reading from James chapter 2 about faith and works. You know, show, you show me your faith, and I'll show you my works, <laughs> and he kind of goes back and forth and, uh, and makes all the Lutherans terribly uncomfortable. <laughs> so... So that's that's always fun to fun to preach on, but I didn't. So um, uh, so essence, the point of this parable, if we were to kind of distill it down, what would you, can you could you make a kind of a simple or like a one sentence or a two sentence? What's the point of this parable? Can you get that down to that to that simple of a thing? Dennis, what do you think? Jesus is who he says he is, and he is equating himself with all believers. Okay? So there is this tie between Jesus and all believers. Paul. Does it have to be an original thought? No, nope, definitely not. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> hey, that, all right, I'll allow that. That's a good one. And that is and that is pretty pretty good summary of the law, right? I, anybody that knows me knows I love Steinbeck. It reminds me of the speech at the end of Great's Wrath. Okay. I'll be there. Whenever yeah. you look down prime person, I'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Faith is active in love. Faith is active in love. It's very theological. But, um, but and you know what? I wouldn't expect nothing less, of course. But yeah. There, so faith, um, faith is active in love. Faith shows itself in love. Can we maybe maybe say that faith demonstrates itself in, in love? Um, faith and love are not the same thing. And I think that's an important distinction. But that but that faith does does lead to love. 
I mean, you think of that post-communion prayer. You know the post-communion prayer. <laughs> Um, that we pray uh, about every other week or every third week, that we pray for fervent love toward you and fervent love toward one another. That this is, yeah, faith, thank you, faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Yeah, so we get that, that tie of the vertical and the, and the horizontal. It's always, it's always in there. Catherine, and then Howard. Uh, are you saying a summary of this right here? I'm not of this half, but simply the whole parable. Okay, because all of this makes me entirely uncomfortable because I don't do all this. Yep. And so if that's the case, then, I mean, if you look at this without the light of the rest of the gospel, we're in big trouble. Well, and, and this you is. Know, and this whole, like, you know, faith, we, you know, faith like love and all that, I, I'm terrible. So this is a part of why I why we're doing this exercise. So that's a very so, good setup. So I Thank you. Thank you. How terrible I am. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, is is that you always have to be aware of the larger context, and and so anytime you're taking a parable, we can look at this and see. All right. So in this parable, we get that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead and the dead. As we get in, as we say in the creed, and that, uh, and that, on the one hand, you are. Um, uh, on the one hand, we have the inheritance prepared before the foundation of the world, and on the other hand, is the curse. But that is not the whole of what Jesus says, is it? So we have to see it also in the context of, uh, in the context of the rest of it. I mean, is that just like making ourselves feel better? No. That's that's reading the thing as a part of something else. Anytime, anytime you pull Bible passages out without recognizing the larger context, you're in dangerous territory. Howard, and then Jeannie, and then Dennis. Number one, there is a judgment. Number two, no one escapes. All right. Number one, there is a judgment. Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. And number two, that this is everyone. That this is not simply some and others. All right. What makes me very nervous about this passage is how does it apply to what's going on in our world today with all of the homeless people? Yeah. And if, if you turn your back on them, I mean, there's so many of them, and then some are in real need and some aren't. And right. Then, and then you how do you tell the guilt. difference? You have this guilt if you don't do something, and then other times when you do something, then you think, oh, I was taken. Yep. I, I do think that that any time that we read the scriptures, a part of our response is going to be repentance and faith. The scriptures are actually meant to, to call us to repentance, um, but not to end there, but to call us to repentance and faith, and that also um, frees us to recognize that this is a continual cycle that I guarantee you that um, like my lovely wife that we all sin much and truly deserve nothing <laughs> but, but, but that um, but that God's mercy continues to continues to extend and that but you're right that's I read this and you, and this is a part of what's interesting about these parables to me is that when we are in a position of, um, of safety, when we are in a position of, um, of prosperity, uh, then these parables are heard, I think, more as judgment. When we are in a position of, of affliction and of difficulty and of suffering, then we hear these more as gospel. Hmm. So, uh, so a part of what we have to kind of read and meditate on as we hear these things is, is what is my current situation, and how does that, and how is that affecting my read of it? Dennis, and then Barbara, and back, then Ray. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yep. To the red, the previous yeah. part of the text. Oops, not that far back. 
Then the righteous, the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed mm -hmm. you, or thirsty and you drink? Catherine, that is the truth that you have. And so it, it, it's not a, it, they, they feel judged in themselves, right there. They, they, don't, they don't feel worthy of Jesus' mer of mercy and what he gives them, but he gives it to them. Yeah. So they feel judged. Yeah. They're judging themselves and saying, I have never done any of these things. They are as and unaware of their it. good works True. as the others are unaware of their sin. He clarifies it. Yeah, and I think that that is, a, that is an interesting distinction. Barbara and then Rick. I think I was going to say a similar thing. It's not the um, main thrust of the uh, parable, but it il illustrates how good works are not obvious, neither to the person who does them or the person who neglects to do them. Yeah. The person who doesn't do them is not always even aware that they're missing right. something. And uh, fortunately, uh, the person who does them is often humble enough they don't even see them. Yeah, and, and certainly don't, and, and may even um, underplay their their work, the, the work's work. I, uh, one of the great challenges in teaching I'll say in teaching faith and love is understand is, is trying to separate doing things from our own benefit from doing it. In other words, I can think of all kinds of great things to do, and I'm going to get all kinds of interesting side benefits from doing them. Now that doesn't make the thing right or wrong. And, that's, and, and I have to constantly be on guard personally against doing them in order to get the side benefit of the byproduct or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and so to learn to do things because it's the right thing to do, not because I'm going to get something from it, is it I, I would say is a, is a, a discipline. It's something that we all have to practice and work on and kind of guard guard against. And you're never going to have pure motivations. Just get that out of your head right now. <laughs> just, just, just give up on pure motivations because it's not going to happen. But, but to ask, not am I doing this for the right reason, but is this actually going to benefit my neighbor? That's the question. Rick, you've been very patient. Thank you. Because I want to disagree a little bit. Excellent. I think this is almost all possible. This is not, this is not, Jesus Christ is not judging anyone here. He is separating the good, I see this entirely as a warning. This is what's going to happen to you goats, and this is what's going to happen to sheep. He's not going to say, you know, there, we, we read Revelation about, all about judgment. There's sure. no judgment here. This is just separating the good and bad. I see it as a warning. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say in all love and joy, admittedly, that you're wrong. Separating is judging. Yes. Separating is judging. Oh, he is recognizing what has been done. The judgment has been made. You can't call somebody a sheep or goat you judge I them. think. Well, I, I guess that. That you're taking judgment as in a narrower sense than I am, because I would say that you could argue. Let's say um, I go out. No, it's better. Andy goes out and steals a car, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, knowing Andy, that it would be a car worth stealing if you're going to bother, right? Absolutely. And uh, and you could argue that that Andy has been judged when he stole the car, because it is wrong, <laughs> and that the law is clear. You've done this, it's wrong. Are you with me? Yes. That judgment has, doesn't actually have any effect on him yeah. until, until he's been you know, caught and tried and sentenced. Uh, and so in one sense, you can say, once the deed is done, that he's been judged. In another sense, you could say, the pronouncement is the judgment. You are pronouncing, a judge pronounces judgment. Please. Okay, so, 
if I'm hearing this parable and I'm a goat, I have no okay. chance. I have no choice I to change. I completely am with you so far. <laughs> I have no chance to change back to a sheep. Not, not at this point. No. Nope. And and there's your warning. And a warning, by the way, is law, not gospel. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so you definitely get this as a warning. There's no question about that. Um, what is the warning for? And maybe that is part three to our what does this parable mean? We heard there is a that Jesus Christ is the judge and that everyone is judged. And we could maybe add a part three to that to say there is a time when the judgment is finally made. So there is an end. And, and I'm going to say this, recognizing that it sounds weird, but that's okay. But that there is an end to grace. To grace being freely offered. And so this is what I mean. Is that, <laughs> is that it has been a, if I can quote Hebrews, it has been appointed for a man once to die, and then comes the judgment. So that uh, we don't believe in purgatory, we don't believe in a in a another. Okay, you have you have rejected Christ in the gospel for your entire life, and now you've died, and then you get another chance. Nothing in the scriptures is going to say that. It's just not there. I mean, you go there, you're. That you're basically saying universalism and all this faith stuff is nonsense. So I'll let you noodle on that, because that is kind of a strange phrase. But I would suggest you look at the hymns, look at the hymns in the hymnal for the end times, for the last day, and you're going to find some really um, unsettling phrases like there is a time, the, t the time when the end shall come. And talking about that final judgment day, that word final means final. That doesn't mean final, that doesn't mean final-ish. It doesn't mean the penultimate judgment or the second to the last judgment. It means the final judgment. And that is why, by the way, why we proclaim the gospel now. <laughs> How many parables are there that are variants of you don't know when your last day is? Right? You know, if they, you remember the parable in Luke about the man who keeps building the barns bigger and everything, and you know, you fool because tonight your soul shall be required of you. I knew I could get Larry to raise his hand. <laughs> Speak, oh Larry. <laughs> is uh, even after the last day, is Jesus continuing to being a living sacrifice? I would say, well, that is, the question is not that. I would argue. The question is... Yeah, it's the question is, I wanted to answer. Well, I know. I know. And, I, and what I'm saying is, is, that, is, is that Jesus, you know, you look in Revelation and you have... I'm looking you know, at he is, he, Well, and that's fine too, obviously. Um, that Jesus is the lamb that was slain um, and, that, and that his sacrifice is for all time. And so, so, that, so I agree. That's not, that's not the point. The point, however, is is that that salvation is offered until the final judgment. That's what I'm saying. And I am, and you know, show me the scriptures that say I'm wrong. I am very happy to think on that because it is a, a, a very, um, it is the, our warning language, right? Julia, then Dennis, then Catherine. Did I miss anybody else? I don't think so. Julia. So this is a question I haven't thought about in a while, but going back to what you were saying about, yes, people are judged when they die, so they rejected right. their whole life. So what about the people who never, and I know it's rare, especially these days, but what about people who never heard the gospel? I would say that it is rarer, but um, more rare. Um, what, I would, what, what I would say to that is, um, in the scriptures, you're not going to find in the scriptures that that um, that ignorance is a legitimate 
argument against the law. <coughs> so it's, it's just not there. Um, I will put that against the reality of God's mercy. And that God's mercy does extend to all. And remember, it's not like God is trying to cast people into hell. We've got to also get that idea out of our head, because that's obviously wrong. Um, and, I'll, and I'll use a very concrete example in connection with that. And that is the, uh, the very um, pain, painful uh, topic of a miscarriage. Okay? So here's a real, real concrete. And this is something that Catherine and I have personally experienced twice, and I'm sure that many of you have as well. Someone has someone has a miscarriage. You're a Christian. There's going to be a really obvious question that you're going to ask yourself: Is this child in heaven? Because they weren't baptized. Because they weren't because they didn't hear the word in any kind of nice, measurable way. I, and, and, that, and so that's a very, uh, a, a very personal part of that question. The way that I have come to answer that, both as a, as a pastor and as a, uh, as a sufferer of that question, is, um, uh, is like this. Number one, God's not looking for reasons to cast people in hell. He's not looking for excuses. This isn't like a checklist. Oh, I'm sorry you didn't get this, that, or the other. God is merciful. Relying on God's mercy is hardly is hardly settling for something. And so, if I say my uh, my child's salvation is in the hands of a merciful God, I'm okay with that. You know, God is merciful. And I don't have the, all of the kind of answers beyond that. But like so many uh, difficult questions, uh, we don't know the answers kind of in nice scientific ways. So I, so I have to do that. So relying on God's mercy is number one. Uh, number two, thinking, uh, thinking specifically about baptism, that God uses baptism as an instrument or a means to bring salvation. It's not the lack of baptism that condemns. It is the lack of faith. Um, and so that's a that's a, a, a <coughs> distinction, but an important one. Um, and then number three, and and this is and this is really Luther. Luther has a wonderful little uh, uh, letter he wrote to a, a woman who had a miscarriage that uh, I would commend to anyone who. Uh, who's interested in learning more about this, because Luther is one of the most pastoral guys I know. Um, and, and a part of what, uh, what Luther says in that is God hears the prayers of parents who are in need. We believe that God answer, hears and answers prayer. And what's more, um, that the word does what it promises. And this is not Luther. This is now Peppercorn Editorial. Um, if you know, and, and, and I'm sure that all of you have seen some of the myriad of studies that have been done with uh, children in utero, you know, knowing their parents' voices, and you know, you know, think of all of the Mozart CDs that were sold in the '80s because of this or that study, right? Um, that you know that they hear this music and this sort of and this sort of thing. That if a child can know the voice of its parents, and, and particularly recognize the voice of of the father, um, then uh, then there is there is no reason, even from our uh, our perspective as 21st century kind of scientific type people, there's no reason why we would say that. They can't hear the word when the mother comes to church, or prays, or reads the scriptures. Because again, it's not my job to, to limit God's mercy and God's grace and God's word. Um, and and that and, and the important part for me is to say, what does God say? What does God promise? 
And what does God in his word not say? And so I always have to have to kind of couch those sort of conversations with what does God say? What God does not say is any child that dies in utero gets an automatic pass to heaven. And, it's, and it has nothing to do with faith or Jesus or anything. That's not in the Bible. What God does say is that he is merciful. <laughs> and that God loves us. <laughs> and that he wants and that he wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God says, which is a good thing to say, right? <laughs> That's and there's the there's the gospel. And so what that means is is that I as a Christian rely on the hope that God gives us in his word and not on an uncertainty uh, based on whatever concepts of fairness I might have in my head. Now I know that that is a gigantic. That's not a. That's like a giant rabbit. <laughs> but um, but I, I brought that question from from Julia sort of down to that very specific because I don't actually think it's helpful generally for us to think in terms of universal. What about the you know what about the Aboriginal people and wherever that haven't heard that haven't heard the word of God. I mean not not that that's that's not certainly that not that that's not real, but uh, I think that for us when we're talking about these questions of salvation and eternal life, it's much more helpful for us to think in very very concrete terms and not in sort of the theoretical terms. Now, Barbara had her hand up. I think when it comes to miscarriage in a uh, Christian family that um, the parents had the intention to baptize. And if the child had come to life, they definitely would have baptized the child. And so I see that intention as praying over to the child that faith uh, is growing. And that, and that does make sense. I, I tend to think more in terms of the, of the concrete prayers and hearing of the word, simply because that's, that's how God's word speaks about it. I don't think you're going to find in the scriptures a lot of talk about um, uh, the, in, the intentions. And, and, I'm, and I can imagine that getting taken in a lot of weird ways. So that... I, I'm not, I'm not saying you're wrong, Barbara, but I do think that looking at those, at the prayers, at God's nature as more mercy, and at the, uh, and at the power of God's word are more certain than sure. That's how I would answer that. All right, I'm going to go Eric, Dennis, and Howard. We got four minutes. Go. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about like paths to salvation. Two, two examples that come to my mind a lot, and one kind of deals with baptism. Um, the thief on the cross. Yes. Jesus. Sure. Um, he's, you know. A, a, right. A, Jesus a, didn't I, say, "Quick, let's come down from the cross so I can baptize you." First. Yeah. He said, "Today you will be with me in right. paradise." Yep. So there's. Right there, you get your faith. A, there's an example. Yep. Um, I agree. And then also, um, you know, prior to Christ coming in. To the flesh, right? He was there in the beginning, but prior to coming to the flesh, right. um, you've got you know like Moses, Elijah, a whole bunch right. of other Israelites, everybody who <laughs> tried to you know keep the law, but that was kind of their understanding of salvation, at least to my reckoning. Is try to keep the law and have faith in God as best you can, and um, we have an example. I would say in the that scripture they... that Moses and Elijah both made it. So I, I think sure. I think a just God, God is a just God, and, and uh, you know, there's examples of people getting into heaven, into salvation by by means other than how we typically think of it today. The way that the way that I would put it is that the the people before Christ's birth um, trusted in the promise of the coming Messiah. So it's not like the way that you were saved was through the law until Jesus, and then it was through the gospel. There's only one way of salvation. Um, uh, 
but but that gospel is not fully revealed until Jesus comes. All right, Dennis, are you next? Yep. Just some, just quickly, we have to rely on this, the, the mercy of God, and we also have to have faith in His sovereignty. He knows better than us. He always knows better than us. His His best is always right. And remember, yeah, and I agree. Remember that verse we had from Ephesians a couple weeks ago, that uh, that the gospel is a mystery. <laughs> that it's it is not something that we can fully understand. I mean, if Paul says that, then that shouldn't surprise us that we don't fully understand it. <laughs> so, all right, what's going on? Was there another? Was it, yeah, Anne, and then Howard. That's right. You talked about the kind of the outliers, the unborn child or the average, mm -hmm. whatever. But my question is, for for the rest of us, where right. the playing field is the same, why do some no. people hear the word and some people don't? Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for giving me easy. <laughs> I can. I, I mean, I'm being a little bit flippant, of course, but. Now, uh, why are why do some people believe the gospel and some don't? I don't know. The scriptures do not say. I mean, I and I, I think of Jesus, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. How Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how it have gathered you as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but you would not. And and just as the gospel is a mystery, I think we can say that unbelief is a mystery. Well. How is Perhaps the most important part of the service that's definitely for an unborn child is the benediction. Hmm. Lord bless and keep yeah. you. Yeah. We don't have to do anything. Right. That's right. That is that doesn't get any more kind of pure gospel than that, does it? Yeah. And I and I will will say, if you you think of all of the 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 kind of ritual action that happens in the liturgy week after week. I just had to, uh, the class I'm taking in my uh, degree program right now is on liturgy and preaching. So, so I had to write a two-page little paper this week on what is the liturgy and why should anybody care? That was the kind of the prompt. And, uh, and, a part of, and a part of that, that is all of these things that happen in our service Fashion absolution, the prayer, hearing, hearing the word, the benediction, the you know, the name of God put us upon us at the beginning. That so many of these things that happen kind of wash over us, even to a point where we don't we aren't even fully aware of what they are or what they're doing. You know, I'm sure that that you are not thinking every time you hear the benediction, oh God has put a good word of promise upon me. You're probably thinking, oh, I wonder if pastor's going to let us have donuts after church today. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're not always fully aware of, of what all of these things are doing. But that is the amazing thing about God's word of promise, is that God's word of promise creates what it says, does it, when, even when we're not fully aware of how these things happen. And this is why... Um, being present is, is kind of so critical to be a part of this, to hear these things, to have these things, you know, I think of the, think of the old cog, read, mark, read, do we digest them? <laughs> that they kind of keep coming over and over and over again. So, all right, friends, I'm calling it done. On Matthew 25. So let's receive the benediction. Let's receive the benediction. <laughs> and next week we'll start chapter 26. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>